Um, please welcome Matt Doc Hall. I don't really know what he's talking about um, because I just missed the schedule. Excuse me. Have fun. Uh, can we? Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, first of all, I was asked to announce that the beer, the free beer, will be going on for quite some time so that you have plenty of time to listen to the talk, maybe even have some dinner before you go and, and have the free beer. So I just wanted to make that announcement. And the other thing is about this talk, this is a fun talk. I give it from time to time. There's some analogies to free software in here and Linux and everything, but don't look for them to be too tight and too precise, un unlike all the code that you write. Um, this is made to be a fun talk, and uh, that's the way I'd like to uh, think of it. So can we have this other microphone turned on, please? Can you hear that music? Oh. This, of course, is Green Sleeves, one of my favorite songs. We'll hear more about Green Sleeves after a while. But first, the talk is made up of two parts. One part is a little bit of an introduction to some of the musical instruments I'll be talking about tonight. And then the second part of the talk is the correlation between free software and the player piano. This particular instrument is a symphony reed organ made by a company called Wilcox and White. It, uh, they were located in Meriden, Connecticut uh, about a century and a half ago. Let's see if I turn up the volume a little bit. Yes? I'm sorry, pardon? Pianola. Pianola? It, it, plays, it plays by a roll of paper. In fact, you can see the roll of paper here. This is a player reed organ. You see the, uh, the piece of paper there in the roll with holes punched in it that is dragged across a reed head. These are stops. This particular one has 21 stops to it. It has a regular keyboard that you can play but you have to pump it with your feet to create a vacuum. And that vacuum is then drawn across the reeds like a hum in a harmonica. And that causes the reed to vibrate, which causes the air column to vibrate, which makes a rather loud sound for just such a tiny little reed. It's a really magnificent instrument, isn't it? Very nice when you have it in your very small living room, covered with penguins. Now that we heard it, I'll tell you a little bit more about the instrument. It was, this particular one was built in 1890, but reed organs actually started in the United States uh, probably about the t time period of 1840 or so. In Europe, there was a type of a reed organ called a har harmonium, okay? And, uh, but they were basically the same type of design. Now, as I said before, when you pumped the bellows down here, you create a vacuum that pulled the air across the reed. The reason it's called a free reed is because one portion of it was fastened and the other portion of it was free to vibrate. This made it very nice for places that got cold, like in the winter time, so because the reeds could contract and expand and there wasn't anything that would warp them. If you take a piano, for instance, with its harp and you put it in a very cold place, the harp will expand and pull the strings and quickly pull the piano out of tune or even completely damage the piano completely. So if you have a piano, you want to keep it in a relatively moderated room that the temperature doesn't change that much so that you can keep the piano in tune. But a reed organ, because of the fact that the reed could expand and contract, was oftentimes kept in churches that had no heat and it would work perfectly well. Uh, this particular organ only had 61 notes and 61 holes across the paper. 
Now, I will also say that in the English language, there's a couple of phrases that came directly from organs like this. Uh, the stop is uh, a mechanism that you pull out which redirects the air across a certain set of reeds or through a certain set of mechanisms to give the organ a particular sound. You may be able to somewhat duplicate the sound of a trumpet or even vox humana, a human voice, by pulling out one of those little knobs. And the thing is, if you pulled all of them out, then you got a very grand tone, and that was called pulling out all the stops, which is a, a saying in the, in the English language, which means that you've tried very hard, you've pulled out all the stops. Uh, you may have heard it, the concept of it's swell, it's great, it's, it's you know, the swell. Well, the swell was a mechanism down below that you would push with your knee, and what it effectively did was open all the stops and also allow the organ to be, be, be played very loud. So that was swell. Now, in the, the Wilcox and White Company in Meriden made 300,000 reed organs during its existence. Out of those 3, 300,000 reed organs, only about 3,000 of them were player reed organs. And today, only about 16 of them are left that we know of. And I rescued one of these from basically a garbage bin and had it restored so that someday I can put it into a museum so other people will be able to enjoy it. Uh, my particular organ has a rather checkered past. It was originally bought and put in a bordello. Uh, and I, the, some of the songs I have are rather racy for such an instrument. Now you have to remember that back in those days, a bordello was more like a gentleman's club where people would go to be entertained by the ladies and stuff. And sometimes the ladies would play the organ and sometimes they would allow the organ to be played. Uh, by itself, just pumping it, but they, you know, they had some interesting songs, and I have some of those songs still left uh, when I got the organ. But then apparently the Bordello owner got some type of religion, and they gave the organ to the Baptist church, and so I have a con completely different set of music that came from that, and they're all kind of mixed in together now, and it makes it kind of an interesting combination. This is the More Beer Polka. I think it's very appropriate for this group, and later tonight we can sing it. Raise your glasses and shout loud and clear, More Beer. In any case, this was actually the first player piano I ever got. It's a 1912 Beckwith player piano. And Beckwith was actually the brand of Sears, Roebuck & Company. Sears, Roebuck & Company was a large company in the United States that had a large catalog of things. And you could buy almost anything from the Sears, Roebuck catalog at one time. I remember that in the 1902 Sears, Roebuck catalog, you could actually purchase an entire house and have it delivered on freight cars, and then from there it would be delivered to the building lot, and, and, and you would hire local talent to build the basement, and then you could assemble this house uh, with just from the materials that came with your Sears Roebuck house. Everything was there, the nails, the, the, the toilets, the sinks, everything. Uh, or you could buy a, a horse and wagon, or not the horse, but the wagon at least, or a carriage, or underwear. And when I was growing up, my parents bought most of our underwear through the Sears Roebuck catalog, and you would order it, and then it would come. It was kind of the eBay of, of that day. <laughs> and, uh, or the Amazon, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and, this, and Beckwith was one of those pianos. Now, you really have to think about this, of what it was like back in those days, right? You know, because maybe you're in the United States, you're in some place like Kansas or, or Oklahoma or something, and there's nothing around, absolutely nothing around. 
And there's no radio, there's no TV, there's, you know, you probably don't even have a telephone. And, you know, and if you don't make music of some type, if you can't play the keyboard, if you can't, you know, play a trumpet or something like that, then th there's really no music. I mean, you could sing, but you've already heard me sing, and you know that, what a disaster that is. <laughs> So all of a sudden, you can imagine what it would be like that you can look at the Sears Roebuck catalog and you could order this player piano and have it delivered to your house. You know, so you would order it and then the salesman, the, the postman would come up with the player piano on their back, you know, delivering it. Thank God I got rid of this thing. I only got 12 more to deliver. And then you could train your little brother or sister to pump that while you and your girlfriend or boyfriend roll up the carpet and dance to the music on the rolls. And not only that, but a lot of the rolls had the words printed alongside of it. So as the roll went along, if you, if you could read real carefully, you could read all the music and sing along with it. Again, most of my music would probably have no words on it because my parents, my parents actually made me play the clarinet. And the reason they picked that instrument for me was because when you've got the clarinet in your mouth, you can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see more about the player piano and how it works and stuff later. Let's go on to the next thing here. Oh, Nickelodeon. This is rag time. This is 12th Street rag. Now, the interesting thing about a Nickelodeon is that it has other instruments down here. And it has a little coin mechanism in the top that you can plunk a nickel in your Nickelodeon and have it play a song for you. The rolls would typically have 10 different songs on there and a mechanism to allow it to stop after each song had been written. That's enough of that. And it would have additional controls on it to maybe play a snare drum or triangle or and then a little mechanism inside to do what they called honky tonk and honky tonk was basically sticking a metal clip in between the hammer of the piano and the string which gave it a kind of a tinny sound and you could control that by lifting the a bar up and down that would move all of the clips up and down to move them in between the strings or remove them that was honky tonk and all of that was controlled by mechanisms on the roll which would tell it, okay, turn on honky-tonk, turn off honky-tonk, turn on the snare drum, turn off the snare drum, stuff like that. And you could buy those rolls. And these were great favorites in restaurants or things like that because it was kind of like the jukebox of the day. You know, you stick your nickel in and after a while you would pay off the player piano and, or the Nickelodeon and, and, and make a lot of money and, and entertain your customers too. And a lot of you, maybe if, if you've seen old, old, old U.S. Westerns and stuff like that, you've seen Nickelodeons in them. Now, that's the historical part of it. I'm going to go a little bit forward now. On September the 11th of 2001, Trinity Church, which was basically at the base of the World Trade Center, had the organist playing their pipe organ. Now, I've already told you that reed organs use a vacuum. Pipe organs use a blower. You know, they blow the air through the pipes. That's why reed organs suck and pipe organs blow. In any case, the uh, organist there left the organ on when the World Trade Center was collapsing. He forgot to turn it off, and I don't think you blame them. And the pipes got all clogged with dirt, ash and dirt and everything leaving Trinity Church, which fortunately wasn't damaged completely, with the problem that they had no organ to play. Now, Trinity is a very wealthy church. They are literally across the street from, the, from Wall Street, the building of Wall Street, right? In fact, there's a connector between the church and the building of Wall Street. So if the market is going down, everybody runs across the church, praise to God, and ho hopefully the market will go back up again. And so they had lots of money, and they had lots of real estate in New York City, so money was not a problem. But the problem is that when you're building a pipe organ for a church like Trinity, it typically takes about 10 years to build it, and they couldn't deal with the fact they wouldn't have an organ for 10 years. 
And so they decided to really take a risky chance and get an electronic organ. An electronic organ, which they knew would not be anywhere near what they needed for their church, but it's something they could get for only a million dollars and they could probably be to put in just, you know, maybe six months. And then they could do their research to get a really good pipe organ. So they went to a company called Marshall and Ogletree in Massachusetts, and that's Mr. Marshall right there. And Marshall and Ogletree had done a whole series of work on putting together a brand new style of electronic organ. Now, in, in electronic organs, there's basically two ways to make the organ. You can synthesize the sound, you can synthesize the sound, but that's not the best. You know, or you can sample the sound, and then you play it back, you play it back to samples. And a lot of people, when they sample the sounds, when a lot of companies sample the sounds, they will sample one pipe of the pipe organ, and then they will you know, make that spread. They will, they will say, well, that's what that pipe sounds like, and well, what we're going to do is, is uh, synthesize what the next one will sound like based on that one, and so forth and so on. But that's really not a good way of doing it, because the, the, the problem is you're not picking up all the harmonics that are in all of those pipes. It's very hard to synthesize that. I mean, that probably would take a Beowulf supercomputer, you know, 50 years to synthesize that completely. So, and the other problem is that they typically take a very small sample, maybe a 30 second sample of the sound. And that's not good either because a lot of times it takes a very long time for the air to enter into the pipe and come to some type of, sta of, of, of state where you say that's what the pipe is going to sound like for the rest of the time that you're going to be holding down the key. So what Marshall and Audrey did was they went to 40 different organs around the world, major organs, and they sampled every single pipe of every single organ, not just for 30 seconds, but for three minutes to allow it to come to a solid state. And they built a database of all these sounds, of all these sounds, of all these pipes and all these organs. And they then built this Opus 1 that has two 15,000 watt amplifiers to drive the speakers that they place throughout the uh, church, Trinity Church. It has two consoles, each one of them for manuals. One is down in the normal or, uh, uh, place where the, the organist sits and one up in the choir loft. And they can now monitor and update any of this software and, 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 and notes and everything over the internet. So basically, you can just flip switches on the organ, and you can be in Notre Dame Cathedral. You can be in, I mean, because organs have different sounds. You have jazz organs, you have classic organs, you have, you know, and you can have all these different organs, and they, and they continually go out to new organs and take more samples and everything. Now, they started developing this software on Windows, and they did quite a bit of development on Windows, and all of a sudden, Mr. Ogletree said, you know, as Mr. Marshall actually said, you know, Windows is too unstable for this. We could be in the middle of a concert and Windows could go down. And that would be horrendous. And this is just, an organ concert is just too important to trust this to Windows. And so what they did was they had 10 Linux computers that drive this with one as a hot standby at all times in case one of the hardware on, on the other 10 fails, it can automatically switch over and continue doing this. And of course, they, oh, during every important uh, concert, they monitor all of this over the internet uh, so they can go in and, 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 and fix it if it needs. And they got all finished putting this organ in, and they, and they asked the organ master of Trinity to sit down and play it. And he sat down, and he played it and everything. And when he got finished, he just sat there. And then he turned around, and he had tears running out of his eyes. And they said, why are you crying? He said, this is the most beautiful organ I've ever played. And I said, oh, you mean it's the most beautiful electronic organ you've ever played? He says, no, this is the most beautiful organ I've ever played. And they thought, well, that's rather nice. But then they started, you know, they said, well, let's take this a little bit further. And they started inviting major organists from all over the world to come and play this organ. And repeatedly, they said, this is the best organ we've ever played. And so now there's huge uh, concerts which are given in New York City. They also uh, broadcast them over the net. 
and you can listen to them. Of course, you, listening to them over the net, you're getting the sound that comes out of your PC and stuff, and that's not the best in the world, but you get the idea of what the organ is capable of. And that previous song was the actual organ playing. But this isn't the only place that Linux has popped up in this type of world. Uh, the Yamaha Discalier is a kind of a player piano type of thing, except now you use a CD-ROM, or you know, originally a floppy disk, then a CD-ROM, to be able to drive it. And they recently came out with a new version called the Mark IV, which has a hard disk in it, and you can store over 80,000 songs on the hard disk, and you know, all in MIDI format. And, and in addition to the songs you're storing there, you can also store the orchestra that goes along with it. So what happens here is when you, when you listen to the CD, you're not listening to the piano recording on the CD. The piano actually plays according to what the MIDI tells it to do. And then that's what you're hearing as far as the piano goes. But the rest of the orchestra, things like clarinets and violins and stuff like that, is recorded on the CD or recorded on the hard disk, so you can listen to that too. In addition to that, they have words that if you hook up your TV set or a monitor of some type, you can sing along with it with karaoke. And, and you can download new software and stuff from the internet because it has built in, uh, it, it actually uses Wi-Fi and, and it has a remote control set for that. And of course, all of this starts for a mere 35,000 US dollars and goes up to 150,000 US dollars depending upon the model of the piano and stuff that you want. So when you're looking for the new piano for your you know, den or something like that, you can think about this one. <coughs> Who says you can't make money with free software? <laughs> so that's the end of the first presentation. I just wanted to give you an idea of, of, what, of the different instruments we're going to be talking about and stuff. And now what we can do is go to the second presentation of what, why is Linux like a player piano. And here we go. Uh, first, we're going to have a prequel. Okay. In Florence, Italy, in 1703, there was an instrument maker. And this instrument maker made a new instrument. Uh, it was a very expensive instrument to make, and he said, geez, I've got this problem. Normally, I would patent this and make lots of money by selling the patent, and this was because written patents were well known in Florence, Italy. They've been around since the 1300s, but there was no music for the instrument, and if there's no music, there's no demand. If there's no demand, there's no instrument makers that want to use this patent. And if there's then no more instruments, there's no, you, know, you see the vicious cycle here. So he was really stuck. He said, should I patent this or should I publish how to make this instrument? And he actually just tried to find a publisher in Italy that would publish how to make it. But no, no publisher in Italy says, oh, this is crazy. I'm not going to publish this. He finally had to go to Germany. And he found a magazine in Germany that published exactly how to make this instrument. And, you know, and then all of a sudden the instrument makers in Germany says, geez, we, we can make this. And they started making copies of it and giving it away as samples to some very famous musicians of the day, maybe some people you know about, people called Beethoven and Bach, and Mozart. Because the instrument that Cifarelli had invented in 1703 in Florence, Italy, the instrument that replaced the harpsichord, which could only play one loudness because the harpsichord plucked the string, this instrument hit the string with a hammer, and so you could hit it soft or loud. Piano or forte? Piano forte, the piano. And if Cifarelli had decided to patent it, we may never have had the piano. Because even with what has happened, it took the piano almost a century to replace the harpsichord as the instrument of choice in a concert. And there's a picture of Mr. Cifarelli right there, and there's one of his first pianos. And he actually did very well, you know, as, as things uh, spun up with people actually wanting to get more pianos. Now, as I said before, going back in time to the 1860s, 
there was no music that you could have in your house unless you could play it yourself. And there was no stereo, hi-fi, or even 8-track. There were music boxes, but music, music boxes were typically fairly expensive. They only played like one or two tunes, and you know, they really weren't very loud and stuff like that, so they weren't really practical. But in 1880, the first player piano was created. It used a paper roll, which we can say, or have an analogy to software. And it was a foot-powered bellows, and uh, so it could be used without electricity. And the, the vacuum uh, that you generated also created a, a, a executed little motor which uh, could take up the reel and, and make the, the roll go, and it powered the keys. Now, it wasn't a major success because obviously there's 88 keys in a piano, and this only had 56 holes in the paper, so it didn't meet minimum functionality. It was kind of like version 0 0.7, right, or something like that. But in 1890, a major breakthrough came through in the fact that there was a standard created called the 88-note standard. And it had, of course, a hole for each one of the keys in the piano, plus an additional hole called the sustain hole. And that was for the sustain pedal, so that you know, when you played a note, it would hold it. And there was also a bellows that guided the, the paper back and forth across the reed head to keep it lined up. And we'll see a little bit more about that later. So here's the mechanism of my Beckwith piano. This is the motor here I talked about that pulls the, and we'll see a, a larger uh, blow up of that later. It pulls the roll across the reed head. We'll see a larger blow up of that. Uh, there are some controls here for controlling the tone of the piano and the speed of the roll, but you could also control the speed of the roll by pumping the pedals harder or, or lower. And then there's a bellows over here which pulls the paper from left to right to make sure it's aligned on the reed head. Now, here's the reed head and the feedback mechanism. So here's the reed head with its 88 or 89 little holes, actually. And there's a little finger on either side that's going to rub against the paper. And so if the paper goes too far to one side or too far to the other, there's a valve that opens up. And then that valve controls the bellows that the bellows expands or contracts, which is hooked to the rod, which guides the payout reel and lining it up to go across the reed head. And so that's the feedback mechanism that lines it up. Now later on, these little fingers on either side, which sometimes got bent or sometimes, you know, had other problems, were replaced by a very simple mechanism of having just an additional hole on each side. So if the paper was perfectly lined up, it covered the hole, and if it moved too far to the left, one of the holes was uncovered. If it moved too far to the right, the other hole was uncovered. Very simple change, but it improved the reliability of the piano and the reliability of the mechanism. Now here's the bus lines coming down from the reed head, and they each hit a little couple of little bellows here, which actually activate the keys. And here's the, the device driver. I gave it a cute little name. Uh, but this is, the, this is the actual vacuum motor here. We have a slide valve. We have a crankshaft. Okay, and the crankshaft is, is also a combination crankshaft and, and, and uh, valve shaft. And then this is a um, differential, a, a, a clutch and, 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 and gearing to make it go forward and backwards so that you could rewind the roll after it was finished. Here's the bottom part of the piano, the two uh, pumps here, and then the, you have a bellows on either side, and that's pretty simple. Now, of course, like every computer system we have today, you can't just buy the computer system, right? You have to buy the accessories that come with it, and the manufacturer will tell you that you absolutely have to have this official motor graphite. Now I know that looks a lot like the motor graphite. You could probably go down to the hardware store and get for like two cents or something like that. But if you buy it from them, it costs you like a dollar fifty, which is a lot of money back in those days. And then you have the, the official furniture polish and stuff that you have to buy. I know it looks a lot like anybody else's furniture polish, but that can't be true because this is what you need. 
And then this little thing is kind of interesting because a lot of times when you get the roll of paper, all of the holes have been punched out. But remember the Florida uh, voting that we had with the chads stuck in the voting uh, things? Well, these would have little chads stuck in them also, not quite punched out. Or maybe they had been punched out, but they were still stuck in the roll. And when it went across the reed head, it would be sucked into the reed hole. And then you would have to suck it back out again, or else the head would become filled and jammed. And so you were, you know, this was used to as a vacuum to suck it out. I actually just use my vacuum cleaner, and I just suck it out the real the same way, and it works perfectly fine. And then this is the instruction manual, which, like all of our instruction manuals, is never read until, of course, the whole thing stops working. And then you figure out that, gee, maybe I should have gotten that little suction thing or used a special graphite or something like that. And you can see Sears and Roebuck in Chicago is the maker of this. Now, between the years of 1890, when the 88 No Standard came in, and 1930, when the Great Depression hit, there was about 2.5 million player pianos created in the United States alone. Now this is pretty impressive because the United States at that time didn't have as many people as it has today. I mean, we have 350 million people today. But we didn't have that many people because a great number of immigrants hadn't come over yet. And, e and we didn't even have all the states at that point, right? But, you know, so this, was, this shows the popularity of this instrument even though it's very expensive. A piano back in those days would cost about $300. You could buy a Model T Ford for $300, okay? A car for $300. And you could, you could, you know, patch that up to what we pay for piano today. If you bought a brand new piano of a decent quality, you'd probably be paying six or 7,000 US dollars for it. Now, this huge market invited duplication. And because the 88 note standard was, was standard, it allowed lots of vendors to make rolls that made that standard. And it allowed lots of piano companies to make pianos that could use those rolls. And this just kept feeding on each other. And then they kept incrementally improving the mechanisms. And if you take a look at the back of a player piano today, you'll find a little patent strip that even though Cifarelli never patented the original piano, you'll find a little patent strip there with incrementally little improvements made and, and showing which patents this particular piano was using and it licensed and so forth and so on. And every once in a while you'll go to repair one of these pianos and all of a sudden you'll realize this is a really stupid thing this person did. Why did they do this really stupid thing? And then all of a sudden it occurs to you, they did it so they didn't have to pay the patent license on that particular improvement, right? And that's, you know, that's what happens. But the 88 note standard was maintained and it worked very well. Now the problem with the 88 note standard is the fact that when, you, when, when the player piano plays, the hole goes across the reed head and boom, the key goes down and the, and the, and the string is hit. But that's not how you play a piano. When you play a piano, you play it by hitting the keys with different forces, sustain, attack, and things like that. And so the regular 88-note player piano didn't sound like a real piano being played. And the problem, what this created was people who even went to blindfold tests to see if you could tell whether it was real piano being played by a real piano player or whether it was a player piano that was playing. And because to, to get around this, they created something known as the reproducer piano, which had additional holes in it, which could t which tell the piano how to hit the key and how to hit with the attack and sustain. And this was able to actually reproduce a good enough sound, a good enough uh, reproduction, so that people could not tell whether the piano was really being played by a real piano player or whether it was being a reproducer piano. And there was about 50% more holes in the paper to do this and 50% more parts in the, in the piano and the piano cost 50% more. Um, and there was about four or five vendors of these reproducer pianos that charged lots of money for them. But they all had different standards. And the problem with that was that nobody could, when they bought the piano, they couldn't get the whole range of music some companies specialized in jazz, some companies specialized in, 
in uh, classical music and things like that. And so it became very difficult to get the, a set of roles that covered the whole range of music that you might have for your piano. And basically what happened was the public rejected the reproducers. 2.5 billion 88 note standard pianos were created, nowhere near the number of reproducers. There just wasn't enough selection of roles and people didn't, weren't willing to pay the extra money for the perceived value that the people told them it was there. And it was hard to find service because you had to keep going back to the company that made the piano. And so reproducer pianos were proprietary. In 1930, the Depression hit, and most of the player piano firms went out of business because nobody could afford these really expensive instruments anymore. And then after the, repression, after the Depression was over with, the, re, the market never recovered because by that time there were things like radio and phonographs and TV and stuff that took the place of the player piano. And the, the instruments that were around typically went to the basement or something like that, and the leather bellows would rot, and mice would get in and eat the, eat the uh, rubber tubes and things like that. And the thing would eventually fall into disrepair. Little kids would bang on the keys and break the ivory. But about 1960, when the summer of love came in and everybody was worried about the environment and stuff like that and everybody started bicycling, you know, you get your 16-speed bicycle and stuff like that. People said, well, geez, why don't we repair these player pianos? They're kind of cool. And they started restoring them and some of the companies that had made the, the roles went back into business. QRS, a very famous company in Buffalo, New York, started making roles again. Playwright, another one, started making roles again. And not just the old music that they had hanging around, but new music. Things like uh, Billy Joel's Piano Man, Bridge Over Troubled Water, stuff like that. You can get those on roles, player roles, and put them on your old piano. In fact, there was a company in Seneca, Pennsylvania, that started making new player pianos, the ones you would pump with your feet and everything utilizing those roles. But they were only the 88-note pianos. Nobody bothered to try and revive the reproducer marketplace. Yes, there are some roles made for old reproducer pianos today, but not new reproducer pianos other than the disc, the disc lever, which is a completely different machine. And this is Linux. It's standard. You get high value for low price. You know, it's the 88-note piano. And because it's standard, people can incrementally improve on it above and below the standards to make it better and better. And people can work more and more applications to it. People can get applications for it, as opposed to a proprietary operating system, such as VMS or MPE or any of the other ones that came before. And this is a beautiful thing. Now I'm going to go to another part of the talk, which talks about an issue that came up recently. As I said before, this is Greensleeves, one of my favorite songs. And I belong to the Automated Musical Instrument Society of America. Um, and I recently went to a meeting of that, and there's a bunch of people my age and even older sitting around talking about their instruments that they have in their house and saying, oh yeah, I'm recording my instrument and I'm putting up these MPEG-3s up on the web. And I started to feel the hackles stand up on the back of my neck because of all the issues that we have in the United States with the RAII and all those people who, Walt Disney, who wants to get every single dime they can out of this. And so I began to wonder about this and I called up um, somebody at the QRS record company or, or roll company and I said what would happen if I took a really old roll of music you know something that was done in like 1890 or something like that and it's green sleeves so it's a really old tune and you know recorded that what would that you know and he says well you know it's true that green sleeves is uh, not copyrighted, but the arrangement of Greensleeves when it was played was copyrighted. 
And not only that, but when we punched it onto the roll, we copyrighted that too. And then there's this whole thing about this, this really weird law that Congress of the United States passed called the Phono Record Law, which as far as I can tell says that no matter what you do, your recording is copyrighted. <laughs> and he says, what I would recommend is that if you make this recording, make it less than 30 seconds so you can say it's a personal use copy and please don't use any of our roles to make it. Make, try and find some other company that's going out of business and use one of their roles because that way we won't have to sue you. I said, thank you very much. And now I no longer sing in the shower because I'm afraid I'm going to be singing an arrangement of green sleeves that somebody made sometime. And some you know, person is going to come to the shower door and knock on it and say, I don't, don't stop singing that song because otherwise you'll have to pay us money. So with that, that's the end of the song. Uh, already I see somebody's going to ask a question or, or make um, a statement. Yeah, so. just a statement. You are aware that there is a project online somewhere where they actually make copyright free music available in all kinds of different formats. So you might be able to convert that somehow to a role which you make yourself and then you've got no problem with copyright. Yeah, that's it. I was looking for the name I can uh, recover. It's Mutopia. I need the Mutopia project. Well, see, the, the whole point of my making the MPEG-3s of these uh, systems, or these, these pianos, was to show how my piano uh, sounded. And I was pl using a role that I had to, on my instrument. It wasn't so much to provide the song to anybody, it was just to show them what this particular instrument sounded like. Well, you, could, you could probably convert a MIDI file to a role, and then you would be able to play your, your instrument. Yes, yeah, true. Yes, you could, you could, you could make it. But again, you know, if if depending on how you created the, if you if you if you just jammed a little bit and created your own song, yeah, then you'd be perfectly okay. Right. Okay. Any other comments? Hello. Can we go back a little bit to the uh, Opus One organ? I would be really interested to know a little bit more about. You said it had uh, two controls each with four manuals. I would assume there were pedals as well, and I would like to know how stops worked from it and how many did it have, because Americans are crazy and making like a hundred and something stops organs and stuff like that. And whenever there was some code published uh, regarding the uh, music uh, generation because I know of a couple of organ uh, synthesizers that are not so good and there is a commercial program that uh, uses samples that is very expensive and uh, stuff like that. Well yes, I mean the Opus One uh, that goes into Trinity Church was actually a five million dollar electric organ. But see, if, if they bought a pipe organ, it would have been more along the lines of $10 million. And plus, like I said, it would take probably in the scope of between five and 10 years to build the organ, the pipe organ, and put it in the church. And that's why they went with the electric organ. It wasn't because they didn't have the money or didn't want to spend the money. It was a time factor. But now they say, gee, you know, this organ sounds so good. And the, the, the the nice thing about the Opus One is because you can position all of the speakers throughout the church. If you have a real pipe organ, there are some portions of the church that you can't really hear the music as well. And so with the Opus, you can actually position all the speakers and then you go through with a microphone and you can actually uh, adjust the amount of, of, of power from each one of the speakers so that you could actually have the organ sounding just like you're seeing on the main part of the church, but from every portion of the church, which is really great. Yeah. Now, all the technical specifications and stuff like that, if you go to the Trinity Church site, they have a complete section just on the Opus One organ, and it tells you a lot about it. Or you can go to the Marshall and Ogletree site and, and, and look there. And if you want, I can put together a little thing and send it around an email tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, because tomorrow's the big but the day after tomorrow, I could put it together, some URLs, and send it around to the people that are interested in it. Yeah, I would appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Yes? Oh. Yeah, 
up here. Yeah, it, thanks for the observations of the comparisons. Um, one of the things that you're probably aware of, but that I always found amusing was amongst the reproducing pianos, um, one of the things that they used to do that they found really uh, exciting to decrease the ability of different player pianos' roles to play on different pianos was to move the re rewind hole. So there's almost always on every player piano a hole that does a rewind. And they would map the rewind hole on their specific reproducing piano to the most common expressive hole on their opponent's reproducing piano. So roles that would play on one reproducing piano couldn't possibly play on any other piano. Even in the normal 8-8 hole mode, they just immediately start playing and then immediately rewind. And so it's sort of an interesting thing that goes along with that. I can't tell you the number of times that computer companies went in and did much the same type of thing with their software, figuring that this is going to give them an edge somehow. In reality, all it did was piss off their customers. Anybody else with any comments? Oop, I have 10 minutes left back there. Oh, I should also mention with the Trinity, one, one, one interesting thing about the Trinity, they wanted it to sound so much like a real pipe organ that when you start up the, the Trinity electronic organ, you hear the sound like the, the, the blowers of the real pipe organ starting up and the air moving through the pipes and stuff like that, even though there's no blowers and no pipes. <laughs> And they continue to, as I said before, they continue to sample even more organs and they continue to improve the sound of the, of the system. And so it just keeps getting better and better. They also are producing uh, less expensive versions of it, ones that's, that, o that only cost a million dollars for the electronic organ for uh, churches that, have, that they can't afford the $5 million Opus 1 variety. And the way I found out about the Trinity organ, I was actually um, on a tour of an organ factory in Massachusetts. And I had on my, my vest with my little Linux penguin. And this guy is looking at me and he says, you use Linux? I says, yes. He says, do you know about this organ? He started telling me about it. I says, no, I've never heard about that. He said, well, let me, let me give you a CD of the music. He says, I'm one of the people that actually wrote the software for it. And he's the one who told me the story about Windows versus Linux. But on the Marshall and Ogletree site, they actually have a statement that says, Windows was too unstable for anything as important as an organ concert. Okay, thank you very much.